John's trying to survive without coffee today. Forgot his coffee this morning. <laughs> I'm getting, John made a big mistake this morning. I'm getting texts going, what's going on with uh, with Doyle? Did he find some lewds from back in the 70s or something? What's going on there? <laughs> Listen to those children's songs about yes. Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> yes, which Mr. Hardy objects to as a children's song, by the way. Our, our guest is the Vice Chair of Finance in the State, Delegate John Hardy, who is also now a County Commission uh, candidate John, good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, good morning, and thank you guys for having me this morning. First thing John said when he walked in was, I don't know about that Puff the Magic Dragon as a child <laughs> song. <laughs> Listen think, to the words. I, I think, think you'll disagree. I think there's some undertones in there somewhere. What, in the 70s? Yeah. No, no. Let me just say this. If that, if that was at any point along the way objectionable for children as a song, Hold it up to anything that's played today that oh, you yeah. listen to. Exactly. And you'll go to sleep to Puff the Magic Dragon <laughs> knowing your kids listen to that instead of what they listen to now. Yeah. Uh, I have first-hand experience with this because it's football season, and uh, the, uh, the kids on the team uh, play their music, of course, in the locker room. And then this year, I don't, I don't agree with it, but this year the coaches allowed them to bring out uh, a sound system that they can play during practice, and the words are just awful. Just there's nothing at all salvageable in any of the songs that I've heard over the last two weeks. But you know, my my son used to be the head usher at Wolf Trap Farm Park in Fairfax County. Great, big, great uh, place, great mm. great venue. And yeah. um, Peter Paul and Mary uh, would were I think they were the annual opening event. It was always they were always there. It was always packed. And I believe I can speak for him that was the show he hated most. <laughs> <laughs> John's not happy with you. John John loves folk music. Um, I do love folk music, actually. Mr. Doyle does. Yeah. It's his, yeah. Oh, his yeah. favorite yeah. music. Yeah. yeah I, I was a folk singer for a long time. Now I just sing uh, uh, Celtic folk songs. I've uh, uh, pretty much restricted my you're, repertoire. You're in a, a very fine niche now. Yes, that's correct. He's tightened yeah. it up. Tightened it up. That is correct. So if some Irish people go walking by, you're the guy to play. Or Scottish, Scottish or too. Welsh, Cornish. Uh, Galatian, Galician, Bohemian, that they're all Celtic. Okay, are, are you being serious now? <laughs> no, I'm serious, yeah. Okay. Don't, I don't, love that music. Yeah, don't yeah. question John yeah. on that kind of stuff. No. It, He's, <laughs> well, you, every now and then you poke people, yeah. and, I, and, I don't know, and I don't know if it's true or not. So. <laughs> I don't, first, I don't know what you're talking about, John. And he does that. enjoy poking me. Yes, he, he really does. does. <laughs> hey, uh, Mr. Uh, Hardy, so uh, let's turn our attention to some of the information you may have heard in the first segment we had with Eddie Gokenauer and, uh, and, and Gary Wine in regards to Berkeley County. Anything stand out for you there? Well, I caught, you know, some, I caught bits and pieces of that as I was trying to handle another little issue this morning with work. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, the county commission has a good plan. There is some antiquated things that are in uh, county uh, co or in state code that probably need to look back, uh, take a look at some of the uh, the way that we draw those monies back or, or draw that back from the from the counties when they do have growth. And so some of those things are definitely antiquated. Some of those things have come from a depression era constitution. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with uh, Senator Trump about, uh, you know, maybe it might be time for the West Virginia to take a good maybe two or three year look at our constitution and maybe do a constitutional rewrite. Our constitution was definitely written uh, to be a depression era constitution. And, and there's definitely some quirks and some things in that constitution that need to be worked out. But I think it would take the legislature at least a good two years to probably work on that to to do that rewrite and do uh, uh, bring it in more into a, a, a the 20th century. Now, I agree with you about about the rewrite of the Constitution, and there are a number of things I think that that do need to be changed. Um, and you and I would probably agree on some of them, actually. Uh, but this particular problem, I think, is in statute. Yeah, which is great. It's a, this yeah. is not constitutional. This isn't yeah. a statute, which the legislature could change that. So, yeah. uh, But if there was any uh, wording where it helped growth counties, it would probably die. So uh, we'd, have to, <laughs> we'd have to make sure that it had Jeez. a spin where, uh, you know, the – I had a conversation with uh, a delegate that has just recently left the legislature, and she had been there for quite some time. And she she had uh, some of the feelings that I had of the divisiveness that, that is in the House right now with the, the North versus the South, the haves versus the have-nots. The panhandles are in a different uh, kind of uh, economic status than other parts of the state, and so there are some areas that will vote against things that to help – uh, growth parts of the state just for no other reason than to just to vote against them. So I hope that, uh, you know, this divisiveness that's in the legislature right now um, does not grow. And uh, and I hope that some of that was uh, 
because you had it was the first term. So it was so a lot of times when you have uh, new legislators and it's their first term and they're there, they're they're very novice at the at the whole um, uh, complexities that go into the legislature and and they're really trying to make a name for themselves back home. So sometimes they will vote against things that are really a good common sense piece of legislation. By the time you get in that second year of their uh, of the legislature, they've kind of become a little bit more familiar with it and maybe not quite as vindictive or quite as trying to make a you know a show for their uh, constituents back home. The House is a is a di- is a different beast because you run every two years. You're dealing with a hundred hundred people that are, you know, uh, type A personalities typically think they're the smartest person in the room. Um, so you, it's it's a very it can be a very challenging place to work, as John knows. So I, I was a little baffled today when I heard that eight of 55 counties are growth counties, which implies that the rest of them are not. Yes. And it, I would think that those who are not would aspire to be growth counties. And what I had a hard time wrapping my head around since I've been doing this here in at WRNR. It seems like in the South, in the belly of the state, the non-growth counties, it's almost like they want to, they want to punish the growth counties or keep the growth counties from getting bigger when in fact the growth counties are the engine that allow the non-growth counties to have anything, you know, from the government in terms of You're being funding. logical. Well, I, I get that. That's, uh, that's the point. So is the resistance just emotional or, well, or could I, they articulate a reason why they I, I did like a one hour te- telephone interview uh, for an editorial that's being written in the northern panhandle talking in regards to locality pay and and you know it really comes down to um, it's not really as much the cost of living as it really is real estate right like I've said on the show many times a car costs what a new car costs a loaf of bread costs really the difference here is the real estate it is the amount that you pay for your home and the piece of property that that, that home sets on or the rent that you pay so that is the huge difference it's the cost and of housing it's the cost of housing and, and we have a housing index the state does a housing index we could use that um, but the problem is as soon as you start to use that argument the, the people from the counties that are not growth counties or the counties that may be struggling will say well why is a school teacher in your area worth more than a school teacher in my area why is a, a policeman or a fireman worth more in your area than my area? why is their life worth more than a fire and it and, and I tried to explain in this editorial that I was involved with it's no one we're not devaluing anyone we're not trying to devalue anyone we're just trying to make it a play a level playing field for what the real estate costs are um you know and and you also have the argument they say well you know if you pay more in those counties then people will leave our counties to come that never happens we berkeley county jefferson county does not compete with any other county in, in in west virginia we compete with the counties in maryland and virginia so those are the arguments that are being made and it's just really trying to educate those other uh, delegates. Uh, you don't tend to see that as much in the Senate. The Senate, uh, I would say the Senate has uh, more members that are not quite as a novice uh, of a legislator. Uh, they've got a little more time under their belt. They've done it a little bit longer, so they kind of work better as a whole. Yeah. A number of them have served in the House yes, before they yes, went to the yes, Senate. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the House has been had quite a turnover. We've been turning anywhere between 27 to 32 members every two years. So you have that new, uh, you know, you have delegates leaving, you have new delegates coming. So it's everyone's always trying to prove themselves, it seems to be, in the House. So. Is that churn mostly with other new delegates? So after one term, somebody's being replaced by a new one, or are we losing a lot of institutional knowledge and experience? Uh, I would I would say last session we lost a good bit of institutional knowledge. I think the next upcoming session uh, we're going to be losing some people that have you know that are pretty strong. And, and I'm not just saying that because I'm leaving, um, <laughs> but uh, there there are some people that's going to be leaving leaving the house. I mean, you know, Paul Espinosa is uh, running for the Senate. Uh, I'm leaving. We've lost Erica Storch, Steve Westfall. Uh, you know, some people that have really been there for a while and uh, and have some really good, you know, knowledge of how the legislature works. But we've also picked up some really good legislators, too. So we, you know, uh, the legislators that we've picked up here in the Eastern Panhandle are working really hard and, and doing a great job. Uh, uh, Harrison County has brought a new delegate that's uh, let's be his third term. Uh, but, but there's been some new people come in. So, you know... Uh, it all seems to work out, but it, uh, it, it does sometimes become a little frustrating of a place to work. Last week, uh, changing course a little bit, last week uh, Senator Rucker was on here and complaining 
complaints, maybe not the bemoaning, uh, distressing about the sheer number of bills that were dropped during the special session without ample opportunity to read them or evaluate them and then asking to be voted on them. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How does that happen? In the Well, I think the last special session was completely ridiculous. I mean, there's no reason to have 43 bills on a special session. There's no, the special sessions are for emergencies and, you know, if there's something that needs to be taken care of immediately or moving money around. A lot of times in special sessions we move money around because there's just a pro we need to give spending authorities, there's appropriations that need to be made, pull money from one account to move to another account. Uh, you know, that, that's what special sessions are for. That, that special session just kind of got out of hand. Uh, I'm not going to put it all in the governor's office. I think the governor's office had some uh, culpability in it. The Senate had some culpability in it, and I believe the House did too. Uh, everybody just had some wants and some things they wanted to do, but uh, some of the legislation that we were voting on was ridiculous. I mean, trying to come in and, and give money to things that could clearly could have waited till January. I mean, I went down there uh, really willing to be able to vote for the fire and EMS bill um, that we worked very hard on, and uh, actually the bill ended up coming out pretty good. I mean, um, there was a pretty good fight in House Finance on that piece of legislation. Um, and I went down there uh, willing to vote for the corrections bill and uh, $150 million for uh, uh, DOH. And that's really all I was really interested in voting for and some spending authorities and such. But uh, that session just completely got out of hand. We had an 11 hour finance meeting on uh, Monday. Uh, vetting all of those bills and going through all all that legislation, so uh, I think that the the uh, the House and the Senate and the Governor's Office really need to keep those special sessions in check. And if you if you remember, we only had one this year, and this you know it, it waited all the way till August before we had one. Sometimes we'll have two, so I think there was just a lot jammed into that special session. I do think that the, this special session indicates, John Hardy, something you said earlier that I agree with, that so, some constitutional changes. Well, I think there is too much authority given to the governor when it comes to special sessions in terms of, of uh, when are we to have them, how long are they to be, uh, what goes on the call. All the authority is given to the governor. And, and while, while the legislature, the legislative leadership can certainly have some influence, say, hey, governor, let's be reasonable. It really is up to the governor to agree with the legislative leadership. Okay, we'll do it your way. The way the Constitution is written, the, uh, the, the governor is in complete command of, of special sessions, of special extraordinary sessions. Correct. And, and uh, I, I think there needs to be some tweaking of the Constitution well, I, there. Well, I, I mean, you're in, you the governor and some people in the Senate and some people in the House are in re-election mode, and there was a lot of spending going mm -hmm. on, and, you know, uh, there's nothing better than showing up somewhere for, you know, a campaign event and handing out big checks. I mean, so, we, you know, there was a lot of checks that, that are going to be handed out in the next couple of weeks that's coming from the governor's office, and, and, and that's not to say anything derogatory about the governor, but, I mean, also the Senate, there's some money being handed out from some senators, and and uh, so there's people that uh, really going to use that to their uh, to their advantage. How did this get so spun out of control? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that the governor probably had some things that he wanted to to, to accomplish, and the the Senate goes over and asks the governor for you know, things that they want on the call. I'm sure the House leadership does the same thing. Uh, we'd like the governor, we'd like to see this on the call, and the governor's trying to accommodate everybody. And, and uh, you know, there's been a little bit of a rift between uh, certain houses and the governor, so people are, you know, maybe trying to mend fences and build relationships. And One, so. one particular thing about it that I've always, always wondered about is the governor's ability to essentially call a special session on the spur of the moment. Like, bang, the official call was only a few hours before you all went in this time. I remember my first term, 1982 to 1984, and Jay Rockefeller was governor. And I was jogging. Uh, back then, there was, a, there was a cinder track around the football field at Shepherd. It isn't there anymore. They had to get rid of it to put the, uh, the West Side stands in. I was jogging at that track. And I'm coming around one of the curves, and a state police car comes up. And the guy gets out of the car, and I come by. I said, two more laps? He says, yeah, sure, because I knew what he, was, what he was about. When I finished up, he hands me this piece of paper. 
saying that in 10 days I'm being called in for a special session. It's a summons? And it lists, and it lists the call. I mean, it gave me 10 days to get, to get prepared for that. I think not only do legislators need more advance warning than they got this time, the public needs it too to find out what is going on. That's, I, I, it's that kind of thing that, uh, now, you know, Rockefeller, because he was, a, he was a prim and proper person, believed in doing it that way. But there's nothing in the Constitution that said he had to do it that way. Why did the trooper have to find you at the track instead of going to your house? I mean, because that's where you happen to be? or is Well, it I think he probably knew that's where I was. All right. <laughs> my, my guess is you jogged there quite often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it is a little shocking how quickly the call has been. Con- we, had, we literally had delegates that were coming in once we were already on the House floor on Sunday night. Um, you know, one delegate told me he was on his farm doing some stuff because he didn't really have a meeting till the next till Monday, I believe. So the, you know, he had the an interim meeting for interim, the interims, yeah, yeah, for the interims. And then when you throw a special session in there, when you have the interims, you just take those interims and just they're just garbage. You just yeah. don't get to any of your interim stuff. And sometimes right. you have lined up stakeholders or you've lined up speakers to come in and speak on a piece of legislation that you're trying to develop, and they may have traveled from you know from some time. So you know those those special sessions they can get a little hairy and and uh, they're they're not my favorite thing to do and um, especially when you have that much you know that's that's come before you and you have to try to vet forty three pieces of legislation. If you think about it, we typically pass about two hundred and fifty pieces of legislation, so we did almost one fifth of the work that we do in the legislative session. We did in like you know two days. So. Yeah. John, weren't most of those bills, though, bills you folks have been familiar with at the end of the session that you didn't get a chance to pass? Not all of them. I mean, a lot of it was new money, $45 million to Marshall for their cybersecurity uh, um, program that they are trying to develop, which I did not vote for. I think that that could have waited till January. I think we have schools that are closing. We have schools that are having financial issues. I don't think it's a good look for the legislature to be given another university that is basically, to me, is a duplication of services that WVU is already offering. Forty-five million dollars in a special session. Um, you know, there was so there, there was some things that we just uh, that I didn't agree with, and there was some things that was a lot of new legislation. So some of it was stuff that we had worked on in the regular session, uh, but you know, some of that stuff was just new and just and the, to change the funding, how we were going to fund the rainy day fund. I mean, just to snap your fingers, and now we're changing how we're, cha- we're going to fund the rainy day fund again after we had just changed it in the. You know, that didn't sit well with me either. I mean, It didn't I, go through, though, did it? No, I killed it. I mean, I'm not going to say I killed it, but, yeah, I killed it. Let's just say John Hardy was very opposed to that piece of legislation in House Finance, and I worked very hard to build a consensus to kill it because I didn't agree with it. Fair enough. Yeah. Delegate John Hardy is our guest. He is the vice chair of finance, a candidate for county commission now in Berkeley County once his uh, term expires after the next time you folks go in in January of 24. Yeah, and I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what the what the county commission, uh, what uh, Eddie Gokenauer and, and uh, Gary talked about this morning. You know, there's a lot of things. You know, one of the main reasons why I'm running for county commission is, is I think that the, in the next, you know, six to ten years, there's going to be plenty of challenges for Berkeley County that's coming with our growth, and I think that uh, – you know that I'm I'm very well prepared from a financial standpoint and a business standpoint to be able to take those challenges on. I, I have a lot of you know financial background, uh, working in the house finance, uh, running my own business for almost 30 years, and and uh, I think that the county is is going to really have. Uh, a lot of unique challenges and a, un- a lot of unique opportunities, and I really want to be a part of that. And I think, uh, you know, being a county commissioner is a, is a tough job. You have a finite amount of um, resources to be able to draw from. You have certain responsibilities that must be met. You've got to manage a balanced budget. You have to be able to uh, fully fund your uh, emergency services, your fire, your EMS, your police, 911. So you have to really make sure that you're doing a good job with that. You have your own county payroll that you need to take care of, and then you're constantly working on the challenges that are before the county with growth. So uh, I'm excited to be a part of that. And I know that the county is really pushing this 1% sales tax. Um, and I think there's some legislation this year that may be introduced that, that may give the counties the ability to do a 1% sales tax. It would be completely permissive. Uh, the counties would have the, it would be permissive for them to do it, but it would first have to pass a referendum. I think it, uh, the legislation that's being proposed that it would go out for a public referendum. Uh, referendums typically have to pass by 60%. 
Uh, I oh, think Berkeley County voters or the state? Berkeley County. So okay. it, would, it would affect Berkeley County. So it would be a referendum for Berkeley County. So all referendums have to pass by 60% unless they're education. Education referendums can pass by but 50%. But that's property tax. I believe you all could write this legislation uh, with a different uh, margin of victory. I think because we could doesn't mean we would. I know. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that it would probably meet the regular standard of what the state has put forward for referendums at the 60 percent threshold um so you know i i don't i don't know if i would support that legislation yet uh, i haven't it hasn't been fully vetted i haven't seen it uh, i think that there would have to be some uh, withdrawals of some other fees that are now being paid by berkeley county citizens before i could support that but there is some movement uh you know like i said completely being permissive by the counties if a county doesn't want to do it they don't have yeah. to do it i see i think it should be 50 percent, and i also think it should be 50 percent for for county property taxes like it is for the schools but that's that's my opinion yeah yeah <laughs> i like the 60 percent threshold I, I i i like that so but we'll see where that legislation goes I, I've, I've said on this radio show quite a few times that the one percent sales tax to me is not super hateful uh, because it does pick up uh, a lot of the pass-through economy that we do not uh, take up right now. It also picks up a large portion of the cash economy that we're not uh, picking up right now. And also it gives a lot of flexibility in people's spending habits and how they spend their tax dollars and how they want to spend their money on their sales tax. Um, I think that's a much better route to go. I know there's been some uh, communications about doing a uh, public uh, emergency services or uh, like a levy. Uh, you know, I think if you try to pass one of those, I'm not sure if that passes. And if it does, it puts all that burden on Berkeley County landowners and homeowners, uh, where if you do have the 1% sales tax, you're now spreading that around and, and getting some of that revenue from your pass-through economy and your cash economy that you would never be able to tap to on, on, into on a levy. So... Uh, that's that's my take on that. I want to address the sales tax issue, John. I, I've heard estimates that if you had the one percent sales tax, uh, something like sixty to seventy percent of it would be paid by people passing through the area as opposed to Berkeley County residents. You touched on this, and I'm wondering if you'd be in favor of the equivalent offset. Doesn't have to be exact uh, for Berkeley County residents. Maybe, for instance, the one percent sales tax would then fund the fire and ambulance fees, and then the residents could have those bills greatly reduced or completely eliminated uh, since uh, they, they'd already be paying additional in sales tax. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that this, the 1% sales tax would generate anything every, anything from around $8 million to $11 million is, is the estimates that it has, uh, you know, the numbers that have been run that it would generate. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the stormwater management fee generates i don't know the percentage of people that even pay that there's some berkeley county citizens that don't even pay it they're not going to pay it uh so i'm not sure what that's generating i'm not sure if there would be able to be a reduction in the fire fee if there would be able to be a reduction in the ambulance fee um so we could our citizens our, our you know our citizens that are here in berkeley county could receive some relief from that being offset by the pass-through economy and the cash economy uh also i i really worry about our seniors and our aging population. Um, the homestead exemption has not changed in since the maybe the early 70s. It's been $20,000. It has not changed. Uh, we're, we're now starting to the assessments on real estate uh, is really starting to climb. Uh, we saw the assessments on uh, personal property skyrocketed uh, this year uh, due to the two-year freeze and, and also I believe uh, I believe there was a little bit of, of a play there where the county's trying to bump those assessments up, knowing that they would get money back from the state. But that is, uh, you'd have to do that by constitutional yes, change. That's, that's, yeah. but, but there's a way around that, John. So the, so the, the um, homestead exemption is constitutional, but there is a tax, uh, there, there's something that I'm working on with Mark and House Finance, All right. that there is a, a tax refund for people that uh, meet the homestead exemption and then if their taxes are a certain amount of their income versus the um, uh, the median, what's the word I'm looking for, for poverty, the poverty line. Right. So there's a there's a, a refund. So what I'm working on with Mark What you're is, saying is this is something you think you might be able to accomplish with statute. Yes, I yeah. think we can do it with statute okay. and not through constitution. What I, what I was also going to say is if it turned out that uh, having this 1% sales tax would bring in as much money as people are saying, and it would be a lot more 
than the total of all of these fees. You know, the fire fee, the ambulance yeah. fee, the, the, the this fee, the that fee. It sure would help uh, pass this thing in a referendum yes. if you would say to people, hey, if you pass this, you're not going to have to pay all these nuisance fees you've been paying. Right, right. Or, or at least a greatly reduced amount. Right. And the, and the yeah. thing that, that I've been working with in house finance is the senior citizens tax credit. And they're, what I'm all trying right. to do is – uh, lower the criteria, so, so basically open that up to more seniors. Okay. So it would for, it would be for seniors who are on fixed income, who are already getting the homestead exemption, would be able to get a larger senior citizens tax credit uh, coming back from the state. Okay. Right now we put ten million dollars. It would be a in, tax credit on the income tax. On their income tax. Right. Yes. Okay. And right now that the state puts ten million dollars, the first ten million dollars out of excess lottery goes right into that fund. Right. So I would okay. like to maybe. Change the funding, make it make it more, and then lower the criteria right. so we can open it up to more seniors. Okay, John. Final thought is yours. We're just about out of time. Well, thank you for very, very much for having me this morning. It's great being here. We've talked about a multitude of uh, of things from the legislature to the to the county. Um, I uh, look forward to being able to. Uh, uh, my last legislative session, I have a lot of things that I want to work on in the last legislative session. I don't believe all of them were passed. Maybe none of them will pass, but I'll pass those along to, to Delegate Mike Height and Mike Hornby and some of the, the delegates that will still be involved in the legislature, and hopefully they can take the things that I'm working on and continue to try to move them forward. Uh, really, uh, I'm going to have a hard charge for uh, SRO fundings through the school uh, school funding formula for students uh, to try to get our SROs back in uh, as many as we can in the county. Uh, so that's something that we're working on. Uh, that's, there's a whole group of us working on that. So uh, got a lot of things coming up in the next, my last legislative session, um, and uh, excited for that. John, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Rob. Vice Chair and the Finance Committee, Delegate John Hardy.